Well, hey, everybody, and welcome to episode number five of the Healers Rising podcast. And hello to everybody who's going to be watching this on our YouTube channel. We're really excited you guys are here today. We're looking at a really huge topic, and I'm sitting here with my business integrator and right-hand woman, Violet, who helps make sure everything in my life goes smoothly. And we really wanted to examine this concept of self-care for healers. This has been so huge here in 2020, but I think this is a topic that we need to be looking at all the time, right? And especially those of us that are here and are serving others and are holding space for people, sometimes in their most heavy moments, we really need to be looking at what is self-care for me and what actually works moment to moment to make sure I'm feeling my best and can continue to be of service. And I don't know about you, Violet, but this year has been huge for our company. We've done a big growth swing. We are serving a lot more people. We've definitely got more one-on-ones coming. We have a whole team that we're managing now. And what used to work for me for self-care is no longer working. I don't know what your experience has been, but I've really had to up my game over the course of this 2020 episode. Yeah, that's definitely been my experience as well. Self-care has been an evolving thing. I've noticed for myself, I'm still, I still have moments where I struggle with it. And um, I've actually been dealing with this personally this week for myself because of how much I've been having to get done for myself, not only in my personal life, but in our business as well. Like, like you said, it's been growing like crazy. And with that comes a whole new group of people into our community and um, more work to do. But on top of that, I've noticed that it's not just us. <laughs> like no. it's not just us with our, commu- in, with our community and our business growing. It's also like all of the students that you're teaching, I've noticed they're having very similar self-care issues around becoming kind of depleted really easily and having trouble like getting their energy up. You know, even with all of the learning how to hold your own field and all of that, that we're learning in class, it still becomes an issue. You know, I think it's so fascinating that it doesn't matter how much spiritual work we do, we still need to look after this human first, right? And we have to really learn to care for this body and this vessel that we've got. And self-care is going to be such an individual process, moment to moment, episode by episode, For some people, you're going to need to do it daily. For some of us, we just need a week and we're good to go for another year, right? So we kind of narrowed it down to four key points that we want to cover today. And I hope that through this conversation, it's going to inspire you guys to really look at what's been going on in your own life and, you know, close up some of those energy leaks in ways that maybe you haven't been looking after your human. That's going to really help you get back on your center and be able to take on the rest of this year and the days to come with ease. So Violet, what's our pillar number one? Let's take a look at that. Okay. So the first one that we were talking about earlier is this whole idea of um, your self-care needs have actually increased and maybe you just haven't even noticed it yet. And that's why you're feeling so tired or having trouble getting your energy up. It's like you actually need more self-care than you used to. Um, I know there's a few different reasons why that could happen. Maybe you can talk about some of those. Yeah. So especially over the last three years, I went from supporting like one or two people a week in sessions to now I'm supporting sometimes, you know, dozens at a time on top of student loan. And I never realized how much that actually took out of me because what I would do is I would cover up the need for self-care and balance with sugar. I don't know if anybody else in the arena does that, but I, my body will get cravings when I'm depleted. And so instead of actually doing the things this human needs to reset the system, I tend to give it fast carbs to just keep it going one extra mile. I notice this happens, especially when I'm, you know, pushing myself past that point where I should really be adding a little bit more balance to my schedule or where I'm driving really, really hard to get things done and I don't listen to the signals my body is giving me, those are the times where I really notice that I come up with some kind of crutch to keep me going instead of falling into the self-care, which might be saying no. You know, I, I don't know 
how you do with that one. But for me, for a long time, I was a yes woman. Like you need my help. I got you. You've got an emergency. I'm there. (laughs) Right. I had a hard time saying no. And that was a big depletion zone for me. The other thing I noticed with my own body is I sometimes override those signals because I'm uncomfortable backing out of other situations that I've already committed to, or I feel obligated to show up in these other ways. And part of my emotional field and my brain is saying, don't do that. But my body is saying, you need to stop, or you need to take this moment to get on your yoga mat, or you need to go for this walk and it's going to make you better. Sometimes I override that. It's really funny how when we're in that depletion zone or even getting really close to it, um, kind of that burnout area, it becomes almost harder to do those activities that are like really, really good for us. I know for me, I usually fall into a pattern and I'm sure we all have our own kind of go-to patterns for when we're, um, you know, not in the best space energetically. And I tend to default to, like you said, the sugar, things like caffeine, like Mm -hmm. coffee, even Coca-Cola. Sometimes I'm like, give me some caffeine. Mm -hmm. um television even just to like quiet out my brain or it doesn't actually help it just kind of masks it right it's totally a mask yeah I mean I just took a week and a half off of doing one-on-one sessions this past week because I was noticing some of my burnout signs right I was getting a little snappy playing into the control dramas I was not being a super kind human to my family which is not my norm right Like there was these things happening that I almost felt out of control. It was like, um, I wanted to have emotions about something one direction, but it would come out a totally distorted way for me because I couldn't rationalize properly. And that's a big signal for me too. When I'm getting to that burnout zone and I really haven't been on top of my self-care, I have a hard time regulating. And I know I'm not alone in this. I see this in a lot of my clients where they've lived in this zone of, not able to regulate themselves for a very long period of time. And so we don't often recognize that these ups and downs with the different emotions we're having truly are a sign of needing to change up what's happening in our reality and look after this human. I mean, we can label that self-care, but sometimes it's just to switch a routine. Right? Yeah. And that's basically leads us into the second pillar is maybe the routine that you've gotten so accustomed to Mm -hmm. is actually kind of outdated for where you are in your life right now. Like if you really look at your life now versus when you maybe set up that original routine, whether it's a morning routine, an evening routine, or some other kind of routine throughout your day that you tend to rely on on a day-to-day basis, are you even in the same place in your life now as when you created that? Well, and the other thing is too, when we're in such a strict retreat routine, how much of our intuition are we actually overriding? You know, how many of the signals that our body is giving us are getting overridden because we're just so used to going, making that singular cup of coffee in the morning, or we always watch the news at this time of day, or I always scroll Facebook before I go to bed. Like sometimes our bodies are trying to give us this information, but our routines are blocking the magic and the intuition from having a voice at that table. So I I don't know about you, but To me, I actually don't have a huge routine. I have little things that I adhere to. Like my bedtime routine is pretty classic, but my mornings, you never know what you're going to get out of me. Bed to me is like that sacred time where I'm like, this is mine. Nobody else touch it. Mornings, I shake those up. The reason I do that is I like to, as soon as I get up in the day, give my body the opportunity to show me exactly where it's at and what's required to get through the day with so much ease and joy and abundance and fun that if I was to, for example, um, there's all this talk out there about creating a morning routine where you do your gratitude journaling and then your meditation and then you go for a 10 minute walk and you do your stretches and you do this every day without fail because that means you are a productive and good human. And I'm like, whoa, listen. Sometimes all I want to do is go make some toast, have a tea, read a little chapter of the book. And the next day, maybe I want to meditate. And the next day, maybe I do want a gratitude journal. And the next day, maybe I want to answer Facebook first thing in the morning so I can take the entire day off, right? But if I got into a stricter routine and I overrode those signals, how many magic moments are we going to miss in our day? 
Yeah. That's such a good point. And it's so funny because I don't know if I've ever heard anybody say that before. Everything that I've looked at for like stress management and being productive is very much like morning routine. It's so, so important. And on the one hand, I can see how that can be really helpful. But when you talk about it actually overriding our intuition and potentially quieting those nudges that we're getting and how that could affect like your psychic development and your intuition building. Um, it's fascinating. I remember we talked about this in Flow Body inside the Healers Rising Academy, which is, um, it's our monthly membership group. Super fun in there. We do all kinds of fun intuition building things. And that was one of the big things that we talked about was how when we get stuck in a routine, um, that can really quiet those messages that we're getting. Even food, you know, bringing up Flow Body, that can be a part of self-care. Self-care in my family sometimes means that we order meal delivery kits that have different food styles than we ever cook because we need that shakeup to change things around. That's sometimes self-care too for us, right? So it sounds like one of the first things that we should be doing is looking at our routines. Mm -hmm. And then um, going back to the first point that we talked about, the whole idea of um, upping our self-care is maybe trying to add some self-care into our routine or try, just trying yeah, to add. like spicing it up and really identifying what feels fun, playful, different to me that I don't normally have going on here because chances are if you're doing the same old that you've already been doing and it's already not working, it's not the right form of self-care. Like bubble baths and chocolate just don't look after my human the way they used to when I was having emotional outbursts three or four years ago. I mean, if somebody came up to me and said, Caitlin, you look like you're having a rough day. Why don't you have a hot bath? I'm like, yeah, okay, cool. But all the trajectories, the stories, the things I've got to get done are still running in those moments. And so I think this perfectly leads us into another one of these pillars that we've talked about. Sometimes self-care actually is an extremely actionable word. And it can sometimes mean that we are having to do actions or chores or crossing things off of our to-do list that are not the joyful things. I know for Violet and I last week, our goal was to finish cleaning up all of our financials in the company to get ready for our year end. And Violet will tell you, because she does it all, it's not exactly the most exciting activity. We're not channeling extraterrestrials. We're not necessarily helping all the people other than staying legal in our business. We're not, we're not doing the super creative things, but it's an act of self-care because it's closing off something from the to-do list that now we don't even have to think about. And it's giving us the space to be creative. Yeah. Right? It's, um, it's really fascinating how sometimes we don't even realize that something is draining us until we actually clean it up. Oh. And that was one of the first ways that I realized that things like, um, what you what you tend to call energy leaks and I know other people probably call it that too but these ideas of having too many options on the table yes. or too many um trajectories or pathways to choose from that you haven't actually made a choice on or even just having too much um stuff in your space physically or mm -hmm. digitally like we've got a whole digital clutter phenomenon happening nowadays <laughs> too yeah it's so true like I don't think people realize how much your environment, your external environment plays a role on your internal being. I mean, we have a whole section in Healers Rising that we built all about clearing um, energy out of spaces and places. And one of the first things we ask people to do is take a look around the room that you're sitting in. And when you look around, can you go, or does your heart rate come up because you've got clutter to deal with and piles and mess and all of these things that you've got to do? Do you have a paper list a mile high that you've got to clean up? What about in your head? Do you have a thousand plans and dreams that you haven't taken action on any of them? That is taking up energetic space. And so it can be a gift of self-care to close down the ones that are not right now and to add more energy to the ones that could actually fly. We have to do that all the time in the company. Like when Violet and I sit down and we do these dreaming meetings, I don't even like calling them strategy meetings because they're more like dreaming meetings where we're like, 
what is, what is it that we want to birth into the world next? When we're looking at this, we open up a huge list of possibilities, but by the end of that session, we have to close it down to just a few so that we actually have something to focus forward with. And if we leave all of them open, it is evident within a couple of days how tired we both are. So maybe you guys could think about this in relation to, do you have um, like starting up a business dream or thinking about moving or things with relationships with people? Maybe perhaps you are considering pieces of art you wanna create or furniture you wanna move, renovation plans. When you have too many things open at once, your energy is riding out all of these different storylines and possibilities instead of concentrating and culminating and birthing out something beautiful, letting that out into the world and then going next. We can multitask, but do we do it well? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think we truly can multitask and bring our all to a product, a program, a course, a project, an emotional clearing session, whatever it is, when we've got 10,000 other things on the go. So I think it's such a gift to ourselves to say, you know what, I love all of these different possibilities, but I'm pushing all of that to the side right now. And this is where my energy is going. Yeah, that's such, such a good point. Um, do you have like a really quick, easy way for people to start closing out some of these trajectories that they've opened in mm -hmm. the past when they've been doing these dreaming and maybe now they're realizing this isn't actually what I want or it's not happening yeah. right now, like maybe later, but not right now. Totally. So if it's a maybe later, but not right now, what I love to do is put it in my journal and I usually put a box around it, which is my kind of symbol for, I'm putting it in this container to look at later, but energetically I do a little bit of a collapsing ritual, I guess, um, looking at it from an Akashic records point of view. Those of you guys that work in your Akashic records, even if you're new to this right now, what I do is this. Let's say I was going to open the trajectory to paint this whole basement again. And in my mind, I was like, yes, I am going to paint it bright blue. What I do is I take myself all the way to that finished project in my mind. So I imagine the color, I see the flow of the room, and then I imagine it sinking back into my body and just melting into nothingness. So it's like I'm taking the final outcome and saying, I see you and bringing the creativity back here and letting it melt. I do the same thing with projects in our business. So, you know, for the next little while, we are focusing on the Healers Rising Academy. That is our forward trajectory and everything we're working on and building and getting ready for next launches and stuff is HRA. So with decodes and retreats and all of that, it's, I see you and I see the possibilities and we're going to hold space for you, but come back in. And I just let it percolate back down into nothingness. And then I make sure that my little squirrel brain, because sometimes this thing is moving way faster than it should. Sometimes I run stories in here more often than I'd like to admit. I make sure that when those thoughts come in, I thank them for showing up. And I either put them in that journal on that page to look at later when it's that time, or I entertain the idea and I draw it back into myself again with gratitude for the creativity because it'll be right there when I need to pull it back up. So that's how I do it. I don't know if you do it differently from me. Yeah, I've got a couple different ways. So the first one I do is like super tangible in my environment where I'll actually go through and start making decisions yes or no Ooh, yes. Um, on the things that I'm ready to make a decision on right now that'll just clear up a lot of the you know mind clutter to start with so I start mm -hmm. um actually responding to the person who I said I was going to respond to yesterday and forgot to <laughs> or I'll just decide you know I'm not going to do that and that seems to make a lot of space but for the rest of it what I do is um, I'm a very visual person so in my mind, I see it almost like these strings kind of coming out from the center of my being, but they're like different pathways that I could choose. Mm -hmm. So I see them like strings all coming out. And I, what I do is I visualize them all merging into one. Ooh, I like that one too. 
Yeah. So it's like, instead of my energy being split into multiple threads, I form it into one thread, which is the current timeline and trajectory and pathway I'm choosing. Um, it helps me focus. <laughs> It's interesting because Violet and I are such different people. Like the way Violet operates in her day-to-day -day environment is a lot more rhythmical, logical, step-by-step -step organized. Whereas in my reality, like if you saw Violet's desk versus my desk at this point in time, like it looks tidy behind me, but listen, you guys can't see the countertop in front of me. I thrive with having a little bit of busyness because one of the ways that I sort energy really well is by seeing messes and cleaning them up. So sometimes another way that I will close trajectories is actually through cleaning my house. Oh man, you know when I'm onto something, when I'm doing the dishes, cleaning the kitchen, getting the living room reorganized, drives my husband nuts, but I reorganize our furniture all the time. Like I don't think our couch has lived in the same spot in our living room for more than six weeks in a row. I'm talking all the time. As soon as I'm onto something, I'm regrouping, reconfiguring, moving it around, and then it settles when I'm settled. Totally. So and I that use goes physical. Along, that goes along with that whole conversation about changing up our routines and our environments too. Totally. Like it probably gives you a bit more space to be kind of creative too. It does. And it changes the energy flow within the house because you're looking at it differently. You can't walk the same path that you were walking just the day before. Right. And it seems so simple and it is, but it makes such a huge difference to how you operate in your space. I think we get too complacent sometimes too in routines. We know exactly where to walk, where we aren't going to bunk into things in the night. Well, what if you didn't? What if you were willing to walk into the unknown to actually figure out what your self-care needed to look like? Yeah, I find for me, when I get into a rut, the only way I can get out is for something to change, whether it's, mm -hmm. you know, moving a piece of furniture or going out and seeing a friend I haven't seen in a while or something like I just traveling have to retreats, right? Like mm -hmm. getting out of that environment. Totally. Yeah. If, that's a great tip. If you guys are really stuck, go for a road trip. You know, even in the times we're in right now, we're recording this episode in kind of a height in North America of the COVID pandemic, you can still get in your car for the most part and drive around, go get lost in the city. I mean, have your GPS as backup if you really get lost, but go get lost and see what comes up for you. It's an take amazing an way to take it. Take an alternate route. Than yeah. you know, like, even if you're still like doing the same thing every day, going, like, if you're going to work, drive a different route try just try that even or listen to some different music than you normally would I feel like that would even help a little or bit podcasters too right yeah yeah that's my favorite. all right so our last our final kind of reason why self-care might not be working so well for you as a healer is that you're trying to be like superman or superwoman you're oh. trying to wear all the hats and do all the things by yourself you're not asking for help or delegating and you may even be doing things that you don't even need to be doing guilty should Thank I have you. a sign over my head right now oh you and I are, we're like we need we're the worst for this I'm not gonna lie <laughs> how did we end up together it's like a match made in heaven um <laughs> listen I really Violet until I met you I have had such a hard time asking anybody for help I don't know if it's because I had standards people couldn't meet or because I felt like I couldn't trust anybody else with my stuff, or I just really genuinely felt like nobody else understood it. But I had a really hard time for a long time asking for any sort of help. This was even, you know, with my spouse asking for help cleaning the house, looking after the kids. You know, we had a horse farm for years and even asking people out there, I would just look at it and be like, why didn't someone so do this? Well, I'll just do it myself. Right. Like, so I would go and put myself in this position where I would complain about it, where I could have actually reached out for support, right? And I think that sometimes we see ourselves as weak or insufficient, inferior, whatever other words we wanna throw in there when we have to ask for help. To me, saying to somebody else, hey, I need a gap filled in here makes us strong because we're recognizing where we're not shining 
we are recognizing maybe where our energy doesn't need to be because we need to concentrate it somewhere else. I know coming from a business perspective as a healer, I am not great with all of the organizational stuff that has to happen within our company. In fact, I'm not even that great with it in my own household. But when I was trying to do it myself, I was leaving big gaps because I, A, didn't understand how it all needed to look. I was busy trying to do all of the things that I really loved doing. And so I would push the other things to the side that I really didn't like to do. But they ended up being open trajectories, open pathways that I knew I was going to have to deal with at some point that were weighing me down. And it felt like garbage. I think when we get to that point where we can actually turn to another person and say, hey, I have a gap here and I'm wondering if you can help me fill it. Not even, I'm not even asking Violet for help. I'm saying, hey, I am not strong in this area. This is not my expertise. This is not my talent zone, but it's yours. Do you want to come shine beside me with this? And somebody else can come in and support us and it ends up being that beautiful framework. Oh my gosh, it's radiant. I'm going to give one example and then um, just from my home life and then maybe Vi, you can bring up some of your own stories on this to help people ground this concept in. But my husband's a fixer. I think some of you guys on this are going to relate. When I share something with my husband, Stephen, and I don't preface the conversation with anything, and I just bring up something that's going on for me, his natural reaction is to fill the gap by fixing it. And sometimes it's not actually what I want. And so it actually creates another energy pull. And I've realized that self-care in this regard has also been to advocate for what I need and what I want in my relationships in my home, not only with my husband, but also with my children. And so sometimes self-care has been saying to my husband, like, I think not last week, but the week before, hey, babe, I've got a really full week. I need you to fill the gap for me and look after lunches and dinners. I don't have the energy or the time in my schedule to do this right now. Are you able to do this this week? And I give him a moment to shine and support what's going on. And by letting him know where I'm at and giving him the gap exactly how I need it filled, is instead of, you know, getting him to flounder and try to figure out what I want, was such a beautiful act of self-care for both of us because he knew exactly what was gonna be going on with my energy. He knew exactly how to support it and we both knew how to fix it. Yeah, it seems like a very common thing for um, parents. Like I'm not a parent, I I just witness them out in the world. <laughs> I have a lot of family and friends in my life and people in our community who are parents and I see this come up a lot, They, especially moms. Not always. There are dads who are like this too, but this seems to be a pretty chronic mom situation where you feel Absolutely. like you have to do everything yourself. Superwoman, right? And I wear a lot of hats. I wear a lot of hats. I'm the healer. I'm the community entertainer. I'm the energy updater. I'm the mom. I'm the homework keeper. I'm the holder of all things scheduling. I'm a girl guide leader, right? And I look after all of you guys. That's a lot of hats. Not only that, I'm also a friend and a family member. And so when I try to be all of that all the time, it's too much. And so I have really had to recognize where I need to surge ahead with my energy in certain moments and where I need to pull back where I need to put up boundaries at certain times and when those can fall back down because boundaries are flexible. They're not permanent, right? We don't need to have them all the time. I've had to really watch where I'm trying to be that superhero and be everything when I don't have to be because I don't need to be the martyr. I don't need to die on the proverbial cross for what I'm doing because there are amazing people out there that can help me fill the gap so that I can move my mission and my dream forward with a team of really talented people who get to be shining beside me. 
right? So I think we can look at that as the grander scheme of things on a business level if we want to, but I think we need to look at that right at home in our friends and family circle as well. And when we're not trying to do it all, when we're not making somebody else small, when we're not criticizing somebody about how they do things and we're giving them their space where they shine and we're actually letting them do that, that's also an act of self-care because you don't have to be at all. So sounds like what you're saying is we need to look at the things that are on our to-do list and decide if it's really something that must be done by me. Right? Totally. Yeah. And asking for help from the people who might actually be the perfect ones for that job Mm -hmm. (laughs) and might actually enjoy doing it. Um, On top of that, I can feel almost like that may have triggered a few people, um, brought up some thoughts about if I'm asking for help, maybe that means I'm not good enough or whatever other triggered thoughts might have come up. And so for me, I find one act of self-care is actually looking at my beliefs and my thoughts and my emotions and doing some either emotional release, running some clearing statements, um, really looking after my mental scape and my emotional state. Uh, I find that is huge for self-care. Yeah, we have to, right? We have to be on top of those things. When those triggers come up, when those thoughts creep in and you really look at it and you go, is this a thought or a belief or emotion I really want to keep playing out in my life? Do I really want to keep this? If the answer to that is no, pull out your spiritual toolbox. What have you got in there? I mean, all of our HRA students, you guys have got your emotional release. We have clearing statements. We can get into those Akashic records. We can check our mediumship if we need to and see if we got some guides on the other side to help us out, right? Get into that toolbox and figure out what you got to do to get the job done so that you can have a free mind, a free heart, a free body to make life a little bit easier. We don't need to be carrying all this baggage. We don't need to keep telling ourselves all of these outdated stories that are holding ourselves back. That's a choice. Oh, I know. I, I felt that right. When we say that it's a choice to tell ourselves those stories that when we truly take accountability for what we're saying, not only to ourselves, but out loud to the universe and the world. And we start to look at that and go, is this the story I want to keep telling? And we're willing to rewrite that through acts of self-care and however that needs to look. Oh my gosh, do we become powerful beings, right? When we start creating our reality instead of being a victim to it. Oh, beautiful, beautiful thing, right? I love the transformation that takes place there. Yeah. So I really enjoyed this conversation about self-care. It was highly relatable for myself. The funny thing is, I'm seeing like through our conversation where I have maybe been like not pulling, I I don't want to say not pulling my weight, but not really showing up the way that I could Um, specifically around this one that we were just talking about this idea of Mm. trying to be superwoman and wear all the hats and do everything myself and not delegate. That's something that I have um, noticed is something that I need to work on myself. And so I've definitely put it on the manifestation list of something that I'm going to really work on integrating um, and doing a much better job of asking for help just in all the areas of my life. Nice. I love that one. My takeaway for right now, where I really need to create that space for myself is having more room for raw creativity. I noticed this past week when I had a week off from doing sessions and I really stepped back into my own space, I had so many cool channels come in. I was working with a lot of the crystal keepers and the rocks, and I was doing a lot of things that I hadn't done in a long time that just, there wasn't time and energy and space for, and truly those things lit me up. And so I really need to look at the balance of my scheduling and see where I'm trying to do too much and be in service too much of the time instead of also be in creation zone and bringing some of those new frequencies and energy to the people that really want to hear it and be in the know about it. So that's where I'm going to be playing in this field. Wonderful. All right. Um, I really enjoyed this conversation. I hope other people got something out of it. Is there anything else that you kind of want to add to this or are, are we looking like we're pretty good here? I think I'll just wrap it up with saying, you guys, you get to do self-care your way. And the whole energy behind looking after your human really comes down to this. 
what do you need to do right now that's going to give you the emotional, physical, and mental space to be able to move forward a little bit lighter one more step from now? That's what it comes down to. So if it's an action, if it's a clearing statement, if it's a bubble bath, if it's a pound of Reese's peanut butter cups, whatever it is, it needs to give you the space to walk forward throughout your days and weeks ahead lighter than when you came into it. So don't write your self-care by anybody else's books or standards. Don't read all the damn articles on the internet that tell you that self-care is candlelights, reading a book and just walking in nature because it might not be for you in that moment. Your self-care might be a highly actionable word and that's okay do it your way. I promise you will feel lighter in the end. Okay, you guys, that wraps it up for episode five. We would love to hear your feedback. So leave us a message in the comments. Come talk to us in Healers Rising and we'll see you in the next podcast.